Okay, who knows what's a lightning talk? Okay, there is like half of the people that is not raising the high the hand because maybe you are tired. <laughs> so a lightning talk is a five minutes talk about anything you want to talk about, right? It can be drinking a pint of Guinness in the ferryman, or it can be something related with Python. The good thing is that you have five minutes. Uh, good news also for us, it's only five minutes, so if it's really boring, uh, in five minutes we can just stop. I'm going to have a timer in my phone, and if you see, I, I need the help of everyone here. At five minutes, I'm going to raise my hand, and if the speaker is still speaking, please start clapping to interrupt the person. That, that, those are the rules. Um, <clears throat> and the first line in talk today is BB, that is going to talk about the EuroPython Society. And I'm setting my timer. Yeah. All right. Go. Good evening. How's everyone doing? All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hopefully bore you only for the next three minutes because I do not intend on you know, going through the nerve-wracking experience of speaking for five minutes in front of a, the tough crowd over here. Uh, <laughs> what I'm going to be talking about is um, is, is, is basically presenting a case to volunteer and help us uh, build the future of EuroPython conferences, right? Uh, we've been organizing it for a, for, a, for a very long time. This is the second time that I've been doing it. And uh, I want to just, just, just basically give you an insight about what goes on um, behind the scenes, right? Uh, in case you did not know, uh, this conference is organized by EuroPython Society, right? Um, we're completely volunteer driven. Um, we do not take a single penny out uh, of whatever's um, generated from the conference. All of this goes back to the community, right? So um, it's, it's really important for us to, to have people who can, who can help us build the next generation of EuroPython, right? Um, and, 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 and put it together. Um, so I'm gonna show like a personal snippet of how, how much flexibility you have uh, when you volunteer with EuroPython. So um, to, 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 give, to give you a quick brief, I'm VB. I am a volunteer with the comps, um, like communications. So all the tweets that you see on EuroPython, all the, all the shitty ones are, are mine. Uh, and, the, and the good ones are from the, from the other volunteers, um, and so on. I also helped a bit, about, a bit with, the, with the program, and so on. Um, so here's, here's what I did in March 31. There's a newsletter that we, that we publish every um, month, and I was just playing around with some stupid stuff, and I put something together, uh, and I sent this email out to every newsletter subscriber with the subject, eat the spaghetti to forget to forgetty to regretty. And, and I, I missed, or, or, or rather, I messed up the subject itself, so instead of spaghetti, I wrote spaghetti. <laughs> um, obviously, I, um, I handled it like a champ, um, and my response was something like this on Discord. Uh, I was like, what? OMG, ah! Uh, <laughs> but um, nevertheless, um, we, we did, like, because we're a, we're a community conference, people did take it up with, a, um, um, you know, nobody took offense, and everyone was, 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 was actually quite happy. In fact, my, my best message so far was I found the eat the spaghetti. <laughs> to forget the regretty, the best email subject ever, and I'm very disappointed about the correction, all right? So the point that I'm trying to make is, if you're, if you're, looking, for, um, if you're, if you're looking for an avenue wherein you can mess up, fix things, and then get back up again the next day, then EuroPython is the place for you, all right? Uh, we, we're, we're open to new ideas. We're, we're, we're open to any sorts of things that you want to do. Um, we're, realistically, we're, we, just, we just want you to, um, to, you know, to, to sort of come up um, and, and just say, hey, I want to do this, and we'll make it happen for you, right? Um, you want to you wanna come up with the, with the next hybrid uh, sort of uh, agenda for a 15-day conference, you want to do this in the Himalayas, well, maybe not. Uh, Alps, yes, uh, but we're, we're there for you. Um, so those were, the, those were the messed up things. And here's an example of, of how we also try to do some new things every now and then. So um, there, was a, 
um, there was a chat on Discord where someone was like, hey, we're going to Dublin. Why don't we reach out to um, local Irish tech communities in Dublin and, and just you know, try and help them out? And um, um, we just sent like, a couple of emails to different, different Irish tech communities. And all of us in different countries just got on a Zoom call just to discuss how best we can, um, how best we can you know, put together this EuroPython. You know? A lot of it, um, a lot of what you see from food to you know, um, the social events and whatnot was, was, through the, um, was through the sort of feedback from them. Um, so again, the point is, if you want to help us out to put together EuroPython in 2023 and beyond, we're more than happy um, to have you on board. With that, um, feel free to find anyone who wears a yellow, yellow shirt, anyone with an organizer badge out, outside. Um, we're more than happy to have a chat. Uh, or just send us an email on volunteer at the rate europython.eu. Thank you so much for your time. That was perfect timing. Okay, Rodrigo's next. Oh, sorry, uh, Omar. Yeah, Omar, and Sebastian is going to do an announcement while you configure your computer. Perfect. Hi. Uh, how many of you are using VS Code? Hands up. A lot of people. How many of you are using Vim? Uh, how many of you know what are dot files? Well, that's uh, quite a few people. Uh, how many of you heard about the rip, grep, exa, fd, those CLI tools? Cool. So for the rest of you who wants to learn about those things, I'm trying to organize an open space session tomorrow at Tool where I want to present some uh, tools that I'm using and have a chat with other people about like plugins for Vim, Vim for Vim VS Code, uh, Linux CLI tools, dot files, stuff like that. So tomorrow at Tool, uh, open spaces. I hope to see some of you. Thank you. Thank you. So next one is uh, Omar that uh, is going to... Dawood, yeah, replacing Omar. My oh. name is Dawood. <laughs> He's a clone cool. of Omar. Like yeah, that. clone. Cool. Uh, please, Patrick, I see you in the list, and I don't see you in the queue. And um, Rodomir, also if you're here, you're in the list. Okay, go, five minutes. Cool. Um, so my name is Dawood. I am one of the founders of Gradio, and uh, that is a Python library I'll be talking about today but also here to announce the Hugging Face Gradio Hackathon that we're running this week and until the end of next week. Um, so you can find us on the EuroPython website and uh, go to the events tab and you'll see us right here. Um, and so is anyone here interested in machine learning? Uh, raise your hands, okay, so quite a few of you, good. That's a good sign. Um, so yes, you should definitely participate in this hackathon if you're interested in machine learning. You don't have to be an expert in machine learning at all. Um, we make it really easy to create demos with uh, machine learning models. Um, so find the events tab, and it'll take you to uh, our EuroPython organization on Hugging Face, and you can join this um, organization just like 75 other people have, and upload your demos here. So some of you might be thinking, what is Gradio, what is Hugging Face? How many of you here have heard of Hugging Face before? Oh wow, okay, a good amount. How many of you have heard of Gradio before? Okay, so still some, some of you have. Um, that's good. So. Um, once you join this organization, you can upload uh, your models and you have a chance to win prizes like t-shirts and such. Um, so for those of you who have not heard of Gradio, Gradio is a Python library, so you can pip install it within a few lines of code, have a web interface running and, and wrapped around your machine learning model. So here's a few examples here. Here's like a sketch demo, question and answering, image segmentation, speech verification. So we have a library of a bunch of UI elements um, where, where you can wrap your machine learning model around. Um, and that's, that's what Gradio is. I'm sure maybe a lot of you have seen the most popular Gradio demo here, Dali Mini. Here's an example generation here, Minions attending your Python hackathon. Um, how many of you have played with the Dali Mini um, demo before? Okay, so a good amount of you again, I'm sure you have. So um, if you haven't, definitely Google Dali Mini, it'll be the first link, and um, type in any text prompt, and you'll see um, uh, generated images. So this is an example of a Gradio demo. Um, you can find more examples on Hugging Face Spaces. Um, we have a bunch like Anime GAN and Arcane GAN and a bunch of different computer vision or interesting uh, spaces you can play around with. Um, so uh, once again, join, please join the Hugging Face Hackathon. Um, and if you have any questions or if you run into, into any issues, we have a booth, a table on the first floor. You'll see a big Hugging Face emoji right by the banner. I'll be standing there, Omar will be standing there. You can ask us any questions and reach out to us there. Um, yeah, thank you.
Cool, thank you very much. So the next talk is Rodrigo. And he's going to talk about smoosh all the things. Not sure what that's a surprise talk. That, that's, I'm not going to be talking about smoosh all the things, right? That's just the title I gave it. Cool. Um, so yeah. No, I just, just wanted to make it clear. Uh, yeah. After Rodrigo, we will have Alex doing a one-minute announcement, and then we have a remote talk. Yeah, by the way, I will be interacting with you, and I don't have a lot of time, so you have to be snappy in your replies, okay? That's going to be important for me. Can I? Oh, oh, wow, okay, so let's smoosh all the things. My name is Rodrigo. I hope you, you're all doing well, and I don't really like to label people, but you guys, you folks look like you enjoy Python, so check out my Python work at, on Twitter. And now let's go for a quiz. So who can tell me what's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4? 10, amazing. So if you understand this expression and the result, can you please clap just a little bit? Okay, that's fine, perfect. Okay, so next quiz. What's one times two times three times four? 24, great. If you understand the expression and if you understand why the result is 24, can you please clap? Okay, amazing. Now what's true and true and false and true? That's false. Okay, let's just pretend that's the operator end. I didn't have much space there. So it is false. Now, if you understand the expression and the result, can you please clap? Okay, amazing. Everyone understands these expressions, right? Because they're fairly simple. Now, the question is, what's the pattern here? Because these expressions, they're, very, they're stru structurally similar to each other. So what's the pattern here? And the pattern is, we have a binary function in all of them, we have a bunch of values that I was working with, and when I take that binary function and I smoosh all of the values together, I get a single result. So that's the pattern, the common pattern in these expressions. Now, is this pattern of taking a binary function and smooshing a bunch of values together a useful pattern? Clap if you think it's a useful pattern. Okay, it is a useful pattern because these are well-known functions or well-known built-ins. You've got some, math.prod, and all. So this pattern is useful, this pattern of taking a bunch of things, a binary function, smooshing everything together into a single value. And this pattern has a name, and the name is reduce. If you go to func tools, you have reduce in there. Sum is reduced with plus. Math.prod is reduced with times. And all is reduced with the operator end. Right, so sum is a reduce, prod is a reduce, min is a reduce, max is a reduce, join is a reduce, something else I forgot is a reduce. So there's a bunch of reduces that are baked into the language, all of the most common cases. So why is this relevant? Why am I spending my five minutes here talking about this? Because I think that understanding that reduce is the common factor to all of these functions, the three examples I showed, and some others, really gives you a deeper understanding of these functions. And it essentially means that if you understand how reduce is, even if it's because of these specific examples, you have one more tool in your tool belt. And as programmers, we want tools in our tool belt. And the more philosophical point, I think, which for me is really beautiful, is that when you connect all of these dots, things start to make sense. Instead of being in a vacuum, you start seeing how everything is related and how everything is connected. And I just, personally, I find it very, very interesting, useful, and nice. So that was it. Thank you for your time, and reach out to me over there or through email. Bye. Cool, thank you very much. Our next speaker is remote, so yeah, yeah you, you, you connect. <laughs> Hello, how are you doing? Hi, everyone. Hey, welcome Everything to EuroPython. Where, I, where I, are you streaming from? I'm from Italy. Nice. Yeah, I hope you can hear me well. It's perfect. So now yeah, you have right. five minutes. Well, okay. <laughs> Starting from now? Yes, go. Okay. I will talk about Django version, a uh, useful tool uh, I used in this last couple of years for a kind of version control for your Django models. Uh, well, I am Danny, I'm from Italy, as I was saying, and I am a full stack developer working with JavaScript too. Sorry for that. 
and Python. And okay, let's talk about Django version. Uh, by definition, is an extension to the Django web framework that provides version control for modern instances. What are its features? Well, you can roll back to any point in a modern instance history. You can recover the latest models instances and all of this with a simple admin integration. You can install using pip install Django reversion and adding reversion to installed apps in Django settings. And then you need to run manage.pi uh, migrate because it's creating default tables for history from for models. And then you can integrate it into the admin, in your model admin, like this one. You need to import a version admin from a version with admin and extend the, your admin version, the admin model, uh, like this. After that, you need to launch manage.pi create initial revisions because this command is creating all the first version in general version tables, internal tables. After that, in the admin, in the model admin list page, you will see this button here. I think it's a little bit tiny, but yeah, there is. Uh, a recover deleted contacts or records from your model, and you will see a list of deleted records. Same for the change page, you will see a history button on the top right of the page, who will open a change history for that specific record. You have a lot of management comments. The basic two are create initial regions, for, as I said, create the first revision of a specific record. You can bind it to a specific model and also add a custom comment, but not only this, uh, you can have a lot of other special comments for create initial revisions, and you just need to use the dash dash help command for more information. Please note that for large databases, uh, this command can take a while. So, well, take a note of this. Uh, also, there is the, the late revisions command. With no arguments, uh, note that this command will delete your entire revision history. So, you may prefer to use it uh, binding to a specific model or using days or keep for keeping last regions or last days. You can also register a model for using with the API in using this syntax, uh, register the entire model or specific fields to include or exclude. And what about Django REST framework? If you are using web API, well, you can use Django version REST framework. Sorry for the long name, totally my fault. I created this package for uh, allowing uh, an endpoint, an API endpoint to display the reversion history. You can install like this, adding the reversion middleware to the middleware setting. And then you can register your model as we saw before. And last thing, you need to extend history model to set in your views for Java REST framework. And this will provide you uh, a lot of endpoints. The first one is the history of uh, revisions for a specific record. The second one the, displays the specific revision for a specific record. Third one displays a list of the later records for a model. And last one, uh, revert a previous version. You have also a lot of mixing for read only, etc. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. You are out of time. Uh, yeah, sorry. Thank you for joining. So, next one. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Who was here yesterday and liked Basil? <laughs> okay, thank you. Who is 
still wasn't here yesterday and still likes basil. Great. <laughs> so how do, would you like to go to basil? Like, because there's a great conference there. It's, it's your SciPy. It's a conference for the scientific packages. So uh, who likes scikit-learn? Ooh, yeah, so here, scikit-learn people, you can meet there. We have, we have tutorials on scikit-learn, pandas, Jupyter, and things, and like two days, two days of tutorials, um, two days of talks, one day of sprints to work also on the packages, so they constantly get better. And we're very happy to announce, we announced the, the, the list of sessions was just released today, so just go to the website and you can see all the sessions um, that will take place. Ticket sales are open on, uh, as being an academic conference. The ticket prices are moderate, so if you're a student, your SciPy is also um, a, a great place to go. And yeah, that's basically it. So see you back in August okay, in Basil, of course. Adrian wants to add something. Um, and if you're a maintainer of any of those packages yeah. or related packages, we're also organizing the maintainers track. Um, that's not through a CFP, it's, it's much more casual. It usually means we're a bunch of people sitting together like a round table and discussing common issues. Um, if you're interested, contact one of us. Cool, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So while the next person is connecting the laptop, I want to ask uh, Patrick, is Rodomir or Arturo or Elena here, ready? Yeah, cool. Please be Roy Rodomir, yeah. Let's hope it works. It takes, it takes a few seconds. You have to say a joke. Uh, here. Okay, cool. No Five minutes. required. Go. Okay. Hello, EuroPython. My name is Peter Sobot. I'm going to talk really fast because this could probably be a half hour talk, but I'm going to give it in five minutes. I'm going to talk about reverse engineering Keynote with Python LLDB and Protobuf. So what is Keynote? If you haven't heard of Keynote before, it's the app I'm using to make this presentation. It's uh, PowerPoint, but made by Apple. Uh, it's really, really nice. Does some smooth animations and cool stuff. What I don't like about Keynote is that it uses a proprietary file format. There's no way to open up a Keynote file and edit it from Python or edit it in your text editor or really make any sort of automation happen uh, outside of Keynote itself. So let's bust this open and reverse engineer it in about five minutes. First off, let's look at the bytes of the file. Uh, this is the bytes of a Keynote file here. You'll notice that it actually starts with two letters, PK. Uh, that's a good hint that it might be a zip file, and that actually is because the guy who invented the zip file format was named Phil Katz, and so he made the header his own initials. I should really make a, a file format now. That's a great idea. But if we just try to unzip a Keynote file here, uh, we can do that with the unzip command at the command line, and it works. It actually gives us all of these files here, and you see a lot of them are JPEGs. So if you just want to change the images in a Keynote file, that's easy to do. But there's other stuff as well. What if you want to change the text or automate any sort of uh, other parameters of your, your file? All of that's down here in these IWA files, which stands for iWork Archive. iWork is the old name for Keynote. If you open one of these, it's not actually as useful. Uh, there's no markers in here. There's nothing to hint at what this file might be. But you can scroll through and kind of see some of the text that was in your Keynote uh, application or your Keynote document there. Uh, and here we have with P and then TLL and stuff like that. And you can see from my first slide, I had the same kind of text. Now, some characters are missing, so this is a hint that this might be compressed. So let's try and find out what compression format was used here. We can find this out by looking through the symbols of Keynote itself with this long command on the command line. We use the nm command and look for, is it bzip maybe, or is it bz2, or is it deflate, or is it snappy? These are all different compression formats. And uh, this last command actually gives me a bunch of output, which is a good hint that maybe Keynote is using snappy for compression. So let's use Python for this. Let's uh, use the snappy Python library, open up that file that we just had there, and try to decompress the file. If we chop up the first four bytes, it actually works. So we're actually able to get some real content back, and you'll notice the full text content is available there. But there's all these pink bytes there. There's all these bytes that are not really intelligible, and they don't make sense uh, compared to the text in there. So there must be some other encoding format being used. And to find that out, we can go back to our nm command again and uh, type all this stuff in and look through all the rest of the strings to see maybe is there some hint at what's being used in here. Now, Keynote is made by Apple, so something stood out to me in here, and that's the fact that the word Google shows up three times at the bottom here, and that's actually Google's protobuf library being used by Apple for encoding uh, the Keynote files themselves. So, uh, knowing a little bit about how protobufs work, if you have protobuf in your application, you need to put the schemas or the, the format of your protobuf documents into the application itself. So we can do rg here, ripgrep, for the proto files in Keynote, and then we find them. They're actually in there. So if we write a little bit of Python, which I'm not gonna show on the screen, uh, you can extract all of that data and dump that to protofiles. They can just sit in a directory right there 
And suddenly now we have the schemas to decode what's happening on the inside of Keynote. But there's still one problem. All of these have human readable names. Internally, Keynote doesn't use human readable names. So we're going to have to bust Keynote open and use Python to actually inject code into it and extract data to decode all this stuff. This is where LLDB comes in. LLDB is a low-level debugger. It is a uh, debugging tool that you might use on the command line for inspecting or debugging binary applications. In our case, we're going to call it from Python. So we'll do import LLDB and script the entire process. We'll import LLDB, create a debugger, set it to synchronous mode, and then we'll say, let's open up Keynote. So set a target to the path to the Keynote binary. Then we'll set a breakpoint. You can do this with LLDB really, really easily, but in Python, it's also easy. You can programmatically create a breakpoint here and say, when the application is done launching, break on this method. So break on send finish launching notification, which just happens as part of the boot process of any Mac OS app. And then we launch the app, and then immediately after the app gets launched, we'll hit that breakpoint automatically, and we can run a couple commands here to grab the current thread, grab the current stack frame, and actually inject some Objective-C code. So this is to be honest, the most interesting part to me. You can take this string of Objective-C code, inject it into the process, have it compiled on the fly, have it run, and then take the result as a string back in your Python code. And once we have the result, we have all the information we need to turn this back into uh, information we can use to decode the IWA files we saw. So now we can go from that binary blob on the left to YAML on the right-hand side. And if you want to actually do this for your own Keynote presentations, I happen to make a library for it called Keynote Parser. So you can use Keynote Parser directly. But I hope that instead of just the library, you've had your interest peaked a little bit into how you can reverse engineer applications with Python and kind of break things apart and play with the insides. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the next one is something about don't do something with mocks. Don't yes, and mocks. Yes. I really like those two words together. All oh, right. OK. <laughs> Levels, levels, there we go. So I'm standing here because I've made a stupid joke on the internet, and while it didn't get me fired, it got me to write this short talk. Uh, since then, I've transformed it into a blog post, which I will tweet out later. So if this is too fast for you, and it is going to be fast, um, maybe read it up later. So of course, this has nothing to do with manners, and it's a mantra from the London School of Test-Driven Development, and it's about third-party dependencies in tests. So now I'm going to tell you why you should mock APIs that you don't control and what to do instead. And as a case study, I will use a very simple HTTP client. Um, say you are running a Docker container registry, and sometimes you want to have an overview over the containers that you are in your repositories. So you want to have the list of the names along with the tags. And this data is available from the HTTP uh, API. If you don't know about anything what I've just talked about, it doesn't matter. You just have to know we are going to talk about, again, to, to an uh, HTTP API. So we will write a function that fetches the data from this API and that returns a dictionary from the repo names to the version tags for each repo. And we will call it get repos with tags. There we go. So this function takes a pre-configured HTTPX client. HTTPX is really good. And we built a dictionary from the repo names to the tags. So first, we ask the catalog endpoint for a list of repository names and extract it from the JSON response. Then we iterate over the names of those repositories. And for each repository, we will get the list of the tags. And again, we uh, extract them from the JSON response. And we return the dictionary, all right? So um, on the first side, this doesn't look that bad, actually, because we, we are passing in a client. So we can pass in a fake client, a mock if you want, and that doesn't talk to the network at all. You can return any data you want. You can also simulate errors, which is very useful. Yet, I'm here to tell you to not do this, and this is not great. Why? Well, if you want to test this, you end up with this monstrosity. You need three nested mocks just to verify that if you call the get method with uh, if the get method returns an empty list, that you are, the function returns an empty uh, dictionary. Now, this is the logic we are testing, and it's uh, drowning in this noise. And the problem here is we are testing business logic, and we have to mirror the structure of an HTTP client library. Uh, we have to even fake JSON payloads. And none of this belongs into business logic tests. So this makes the tests less expressive, and it also makes them more brittle, because you don't want to rewrite your business tests just because you switched out your HTTP libraries, which takes us to the core point. There's a difference between owning a component 
and uh, like an HTTP library or a database driver and owning the API to say component. In other words, if you want to have uh, an API that you don't own and you want to mock it, you write a thin layer around it and mock that. And this is what we're gonna do right now. And I was too slow switching slides, I'm sorry. Um, so we all have a class, we call it Docker Registry Client. It has an HTTPX client and we write on get repos method. There it is, it's the same code like before. And if we do the same thing for get repo tags, it gets the repo name, returns the tags, right? It's important to keep this layer as simple as possible because this is the hardest one to test. This is interacting with the dirty world. So adding logic into this layer means that you are just uh, moving the problems into a different layer. It's not helpful. So now we rewrite our function and it looks like this. Now look at this much more idiomatic. Now you can actually see that you could make it a dict comprehension, something that was not as obvious before. So we got cleaner code. This is already a big win here. Now let's rewrite the test. And look at that, only one mock, one lambda. It's simpler, the font is bigger, so it's clearly better. And um, once you want to do more complex tests, like when get repos doesn't just return an empty list, uh, you just add a mock or a lambda for uh, the, the tax function. You don't have to have uh, the, a smart get method mocked out, which is possible but uh, messy. So obviously this makes more sense in more complex uh, s um, software, but the same rules apply. Um, and this is it. This is why you don't mock what you don't own. Uh, I'm Hinek. I'm at Hinek on Twitter. I'm happy to talk about all this kind of stuff. I have opinions. Come and fight me. Thank you. Thank you very much. How much? You see, you have 20 wow. seconds. Let me tell you more about my opinions. <laughs> okay, we're going to steal the adapter because I think, let me see. Yep, yeah, I don't have the others here. Uh, two reminders, I have a Sony phone there that was in the floor here, so if someone loses the phone. And if you have a ticket for a social event, go and pick up the physical ticket. Um, oh. Okay. Start? Yes. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick. I am one of the organizers of this conference, and I really want to invite you to come for a run tomorrow. Um, if you wanna, if you wanna, you know, choose which uh, time of the day you can go on Discord. We have a like, very simple poll, so you can choose and you can come run with us. Uh, but other than running, I really like uh, uh, writing tools for other people, and one of the tools I've built recently is called Latest.cut, and is I built it because I was a bit frustrated by, uh, you know, having to find the, the latest version of a software like Python. For example, you have to go to the website, you have to parse this, fi uh, this page and maybe find it here. Um, and I wanted to find, to make something that's a bit easier to use. So there's latest of cut, you can go type Python and get the latest version. Um, you can also use it from uh, the command line, so you can use it with curl, you can use it, you can pipe it to other commands. And for some reason, it also works from SSH. So you can go there, um, and you can get the latest version of Python. Uh, yeah, hopefully it's useful for someone. Uh, go to latest.cut and use it. Thank you. Cool, thank you, Patrick. So next one is Rodomir. Sorry. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I think, yeah. Go for it. Sorry if I was mixing. Uh, Let's hope. Now I need Chuk to say some history about Dublin. Where are you, Chuk? <laughs> when I was in Dublin, uh, I can I can mim. <laughs> Almost there. Mm, yes. That's okay. So five minutes. Go. Thank you. So I want to tell you about a certain uh, mechanism that uh, first entomologists and then social uh, science uh, people have discovered. It's about how ants and termites and uh, Wikipedia editors and uh, open source developers build large things. Basically, how do you? build something big, right? You start a committee and you discuss how you are going to build it in very tiny details. 
And then when you have it ready, you give the plans to the developers and the developers, of course, go and implement it, right? Only one problem, uh, Ant and uh, open source developers don't read. So, <laughs> so instead how they work is they just go on the site and look around and uh, see, oh, there is something missing there. I will, I will add it. Or here, there is a comment that says, oh, this needs fixing. So maybe I will look into fixing that. So they basically use their environment and uh, the pheromones or comments that are added to that environment by, by other uh, agents working along them to decide uh, what to do and how to do it. And that's called, uh, this way they can uh, build really, really big uh, things without first planning them up front. And, uh, you know, the plan tends to, you know, not survive uh, actual implementation. There is always changing requirements. There is always uh, unforeseen circumstances that, uh, that you need to take into account. Uh, with this kind of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, strategy, you actually adapt the circumstances as they are discovered. And uh, it's a very uh, robust way of uh, building software. Maybe the end result doesn't look great. There are some, you know, uh, extrusions that don't have any <laughs> use and don't, don't look pretty. But uh, over the years, because uh, the work of so many agents is accumulating uh, over the work of previous, and you, you get those, this incremental improvement, huge projects, huge old projects, so I don't know, like Emacs or uh, Vim or uh, not just text editor, like BSD kernel, <laughs> or things like that, they really grow very big and very solid and very useful. <coughs> and that... That mechanism is called stigmergy. The, this uh, mechanism of uh, looking at your environment and reacting to it and building uh, the thing in, by multiple agents without actually communicating directly. There is only one problem with stigmergy. It's uh, sensitive to external stimuli. Which is, most of the time, it's good, right? You want to adapt to the world around you. The problem is, if, if you have ants building a nest and you put some sugar around it, you can divert some of the ants from making them ignore the pheromones and instead follow the sugar. And uh, this way, you can kind of uh, take over the project. Uh, you just need very little sugar because only a few ants will leave enough pheromones for other ants to follow. What you can do? You can make the ants focus on just one part of the nest that you care about and abandon all the rest. In open source projects, you can recognize that this is happening if you have like a bug report that everybody thinks is important, but it's not being worked on for 10 years because everybody is working on something else. Maybe something is wrong there, but there are more things you can do. If you keep moving the sugar around, you can uh, do something that's called move fast and break things. So basically you prevent this accumulation of quality, this accumulation of work from happening, and the project actually never gets finished, never gets anywhere. And uh, if there are projects that are also, uh, depending on it, you are also destroying those projects. So it's uh, very dangerous uh, if you have uh, such, uh, such uh, interference from outside into a project where, where stigma, where the internal communication happens to the environment. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rodomir. Um, now we're going to welcome um, Sir Arturo uh, with a talk about MOC scikit-learn. Just a second while we set up the AV. Is Eduardo here? Eduardo, if you're here, please report there. Is it working? It is not working. Um, do I have just to plug it in? And 
No, I don't have it ready in any single speed. Yeah, well, well, then you need to log in with your mind there. Let's see. Let's see. Check. I think you need to put um, it. Eduardo was here, sorry. No? no Let's Eduardo. see if it works. Let's talk about Seculite. Seculite. Do you know? Don't you know? Yeah. Uh, but then, okay. Have you... Yeah, that's gonna be yeah. it. Can you conclude here? Okay. See? Okay, good. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm really glad to be here. I'm going to present the MOOC on machine learning in Python with Scikit-Learn. Uh, some of you may already know it, but because we ha already had a couple of sessions. And uh, it's a work that we have uh, between the Scikit-Learn core developers, or at least a subset of us, and uh, some French institutions, which are the INRIA and the France Université Numérique. And my name uh, is Arturo Amor. Uh, you can find me in my social networks like that. So uh, why do I have to pay attention to this guy if it's so late and we all want to go to the uh, social event? Well, because uh, a couple of years ago, there was uh, this tweet um, from this person saying that uh, we have a regularization implemented by default in the logistic regression in scikit-learn. And uh, he's, he claims that probably not a lot of authors uh, know about this, even if it's in the documentation. Uh, so, of course, I mean, it's in the documentation, but also we wanted to create a MOOC for people that even if they have a background in machine learning, they can find or uh, how to use good practices like hyperparameter tuning so that they don't really have to worry if this is the, de the default value or not. So what makes us different? Uh, first of all, I would say that it's uh, moderated by some of the core developers, as I already said. Uh, it's also quite good because uh, you have nothing to install in the font platform. Uh, you, you have everything provided. Uh, we also have a static version, which is uh, this one here. And it's accessible during the whole year. But uh, in the form platform, you can also get a free attestation uh, whenever you have a score above 60% above, uh, of the questions. Uh, we have quizzes and we have uh, wrap-up quizzes, but I'm going to come back to this later. And uh, also something that I find quite important is that we are uh, following the spirit of open source, meaning that everybody can contribute to the course and uh, make a pull request to say like, oh, okay, maybe this can be explored a little bit more in detail, maybe this was not phrased correctly, uh, maybe I can add up a, a, a wrap up table, these kind of things. So we are really open to, to getting feedback from uh, users and educators. And that's the site where you can uh, make your pull request. And this is the fun uh, site that I was mentioning. So uh, uh, our philosophy is hands-on. You learn by doing. And it's divided in seven modules, uh, plus one introductory module. Uh, we have 15 video lessons that hopefully are not very distractful, but the other way around. It, uh, they are meant to make the course more uh, friendly and didactic. And also we have uh, 70 programming notebooks with 21 exercises that are not graded, but what we grade is the 26 quizzes and wrap-up quizzes. Um, in particular, the seven modules contain uh, a narrative of uh, having the predictive pipeline so that from the very first notebook you get to uh, explore a bit the data set and you build your first mo uh, model. Great. Um, and in particular, you can uh, learn a lot about hyperparameter tuning and don't commit, uh, don't make this kind of mistakes that the guy in the tweet say. So um, in each session we have had like uh, around 105,000, um, 1,500 sorry, uh, participants per session, and a lot of very positive feedback in the forum. We have a very active forum. Um, 
I just want to invite you to join uh, this common effort, learn something new. Uh, we are opening a new session in October, so stay tuned. And many thanks uh, to all of you. Uh, this is the team on left hand, the teachers, and the right hand, the pedagog pedagogical uh, and technical team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arturo. Up next on the stage, we'll have Elena announcing a Python Weekend conference. In the meantime, uh, I'll tell you that the roster for the Lightning Talks is pretty full today. Uh, there will be another round of Lightning Talks tomorrow, and registrations for those will open at 8 a.m. So be first uh, so you get a slot. Is it working? Oh my god. I broke it. What's happening? Just. Did you try turning it off and on again? Shoot. It's a universal signal, right? Guys, I'm super sorry about that. Uh, unplug it, unplug it. Unplug yes. it. I'll give you the second. There, go. Okay. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Right. In the meantime, I can announce more. Um, for instance, the fact that tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. we'll be welcoming you all here for a announcement and then follow a keynote session. It's going to be on the Gill. It's something you probably have never heard of uh, because it's a very, very uh, foreign concept mm -hmm. to most Python developers. Uh, and something about multi, multi threading or processing, I forgot which one exactly. It doesn't really matter, it's interchangeable. Um, yeah, so there's that. We're nearly done, right? Because I'm not really okay, good at improvising okay. things. Keep going. <laughs> sure, of course. Them. We are working on um, it. Oh, you weren't joking. <coughs> yeah, what sure. So. Ready. Ah. Um, yeah, OK, it's fine. Hi, guys. Hey, uh, I'm Alenka. I'm tech community manager at uh, One Fruit Company, Kiwi.com, Travel and Tech. Maybe you know us. So with my internal Python community, we are organizing all kind of crazy Python events all over the Europe, thanks to our travel company. We are traveling a lot. And I just wanted to announce our next Python weekend in Barcelona. It will be from 19th to 21st of August. And you can check out all the information at uh, CodeKiwiCom Python weekend. Uh, it's highly intensive educational event where we will be building the prototype of Kiwi.com core technology. Our eight mentors will be guiding you on this process and it's completely free for the community. So just check out the link. I hope you captured that, yeah. And uh, ping me on Twitter if you have any questions about that and I will see you soon. Ciao, Kiwi. Thank you, Elena. We'll now close off the lightning talks with the last talk of the day. Um, I have the honor of announcing Jakob, uh, who is the EuroPython Society auditor and a long contributing member to our uh, efforts. And he will talk about testing inner functions. So I assume that you all have heard about inner functions in Python. They are functions inside the scope of another function. You have the basic case uh, where you have just a, a function inside a function. Like uh, on my slide here, I have the function f with g and h as uh, inner functions. They're also called nested functions. Uh, we have a more advanced uh, uh, model where we have uh, the function inside a method instead, and we also have the possibility of do, doing deep nesting. So far, nothing really interesting. But how do we test inner functions? We don't, because we can't reach them, right? 
They are in a, an inner scope because we want nobody else to, to depend on them so that we can use them uh, to implement something that is an implementation detail. So wouldn't it be nice if we could do something like this, uh, where we, from a package which we call nested, import nested. And as in our tests, we import our uh, function f, our class c, and our function m. And then we test, for exam example, the function g, which is an in inner function. And we used some sort of way to get access to this, saying that, well, it comes from the function f, it's called g, and it needs to have the uh, free variables v1 and v2 set. And then I do the test. And I do the same thing uh, with the other cases as well. I can test my uh, function h. I can test uh, my function k, which is inside the c.foo method. And I can do nested testing, where I need to fish out uh, the function n. And from the function n, I need to fish out the function o. Well, it turns out that this is possible. So let's go see the magic, because that's where the real fun begins. So this function nested takes uh, a reference to the outer function. We give it the inner name, and we give it the free variables. So then, first we check that this is actually callable, which we do by checking that it, the outer function is an instance of types.function type or types.method type. And then we take out the code object of this uh, function. And then we go through uh, something called CO constants in this one, which are the actual uh, references to uh, all the constants inside this function object, which uh, includes all the, uh, the inner functions. And an inner function is a, an instance of the type types.code type and it has the name we're look and if it has the name we're looking for then we create a new function object that contains the code object of that and we bind the free variables uh, so that they each have a closure and we do that up in this function at the top called free vars. Oops. And if you want to get access to this nested function, uh, nested module, then it's available at this URL. Who learned something new? Great. <laughs> I didn't come up with this myself. I found it as a uh, on Stack Overflow with no upvotes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Um, I'd like to ask you to join me in one more round of applause for all of our Lightning Talk contributors for today.